Hello. The subject of my speech is the free software movement and the development of the GNU operating system. What is free software? Free software means software that respects the user's freedom. There are four essential freedoms that the user of software should always have. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to help yourself. That's the freedom to study the program source code and then change it to do what you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor. That's the freedom to make copies and distribute them to others. And freedom three is the freedom to help your community. That's the freedom to publish or distribute a modified version when you wish. You should always have these four freedoms and a program that respects all four freedoms is free software. But if one of these freedoms is substantially missing, then the program is proprietary software, non-free software. And that means that this program is being distributed as part of an anti-social scheme to keep users divided and helpless. Divided because each user is forbidden to share with another user and helpless because the users don't have the source code which means that they can't change anything, they can't even tell what the program's really doing and they are forced to accept whatever the software developer chooses to impose on them. But why are these four freedoms the essential freedoms? What makes them essential? Freedom two is essential on basic ethical grounds. So that you can live an upright life as a good citizen, as a member of your community. If you use a program that does not give you freedom number two, then you are in danger at any moment of falling into a moral dilemma whenever your friend asks you for a copy of the program. At that moment, you will be compelled to choose between two evils. One evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to refuse your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. Once you're in this situation, you should choose the lesser evil. The lesser evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. This evil is lesser because we can presume that your friend is a good person and has treated you well and deserves your cooperation, whereas the developer of the program has deliberately attacked the solidarity of your community and does not deserve good treatment from you. So, if you have to do some kind of wrong to one or the other, better it should be the software developer than your friend. However, to be the lesser evil does not mean it is good. It's never a good thing to make an agreement and then not keep it. This can be better than the alternative, but it's not good. And an unauthorized copy of a non-free soft software package is not a good thing either. The only worse thing in the field of software than an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program is an authorized copy of that proprietary program which imposes all the same moral disadvantages on its users and in addition probably ends up benefiting the developer, the perpetrator of the whole scheme. So once you have fully understood this moral dilemma, what you should really do is make sure it doesn't happen to you. Make sure that you never end up in this dilemma. And the way to do that is by not using this proprietary program. To use a proprietary program means you're going to be in a bad ethical situation. So don't use it at all. Once, when John Perry Barlow was giving a speech about these issues, he asked the audience 
raise your hand if you have no unauthorized copies of software. And he was surprised to see a hand go up. And then he saw it was me and he laughed and he said, oh, of course you, Stallman, because he knew. The reason all my copies of software are authorized is because they are all free software and everyone can make authorized copies and give them to other people. You see, the most important resource of any society is not a physical resource, it's a psychosocial resource. It's the spirit of goodwill, the spirit of helping your neighbor. This spirit makes the difference between a livable society and a doggy dog jungle. It's no accident that the world's major religions for thousands of years have actively promoted the idea of helping your neighbor. Because if we can increase the level of this spirit of goodwill, even by a little bit, it makes life better for everyone. So what does it mean when powerful social institutions start saying that it's wrong to share with your neighbor? What are they doing? They're poisoning this spirit of goodwill. And that's something no society can afford there's no society in the world that has too much spirit of goodwill. And what does it mean when they say that if you share with your neighbor, you're a pirate? What are they doing? They're trying to equate helping your neighbor with attacking a ship. Well, nothing could be more wrong than that. Piracy is a very big problem in some parts of the world today and it's very very bad but helping your neighbor is admirable so the two cannot be compared and what does it mean when they start imposing harsh vicious punishments on people who share with their neighbors punishments sometimes of years in prison are proposed for people who help their neighbors what are they doing? What level of terror is it going to take before your neighbors are too scared to help you and before you are too scared to help them? I'm sure you don't want that kind of terror campaign to be let loose in your society, but that's exactly what the developers of proprietary software are trying to do. And I believe that that terror campaign should be ended and I use the term terror campaign based on thought. You see, in two different countries, the developers of proprietary software have threatened the public with being raped for having unauthorized copies of software. And when they start threatening people with rape, I say that that, car that's, that qualifies as a terror campaign. That's the reason for freedom number two, the freedom to help your neighbor, the freedom to make copies and distribute them to other people. Freedom zero is necessary for a different reason, so that you can have control of your computer. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. It may be surprising, but there are programs that don't give you even that little bit of freedom, that restrict how you can run the program, how much you can run the program, what you can use the program for. And obviously that is not having control of your computer. So freedom zero is essential, but freedom zero is not enough. Because freedom zero just means you can choose when and whether to do whatever the program's developer chose for you. And that's not really control of your computer. To have full control, you need freedom number one. Freedom number one is the freedom to help yourself. The freedom to study the source code and change it to do what you want it to do. That means you can use your computer to do what you want and not just what the program's developer chose to impose on you. If you don't have freedom number one, then you can't even tell what the program is really doing. All you can do is put blind faith in the program's developer, and some of these developers don't deserve that blind faith. Many non-free programs contain malicious features. 
designed not to serve the user, but rather to spy on the user, annoy the user, restrict the user, hack the user, or sometimes all of them at once. Spyware is quite common, one non-free program that you may have heard of that contains spy features is called Windows XP. For instance, when the user of Windows XP searches her own files for a word, Windows sends a message to Microsoft saying what word was searched for. That's one spy feature. There's another. When Windows XP asks for an upgrade, it's it informs Microsoft of the list of all the software installed on the machine. That's another spy feature. These spy features were not easy to discover. For instance, the list of installed software is sent encrypted, so it required some careful research to figure out that Windows is spying on people in that way. But spying is not limited to Windows. Windows Media Player has spy features also. In fact, it does total surveillance. It reports to Microsoft all the sites that the user looks at. But please don't think that Microsoft is unique because many proprietary software developers put spyware into their software. For instance, RealPlayer spies on the user just like Windows Media Player. Complete surveillance reporting all the sites that the user looks at. And the TiVo does the same thing, reporting all the pr programs that the user looks at. Now, when the TiVo... The, the TiVo example is very useful to illustrate a common confusion. When the TiVo was first released, Many in the free software community applauded because the TiVo uses a lot of free software. It actually uses a small GNU plus Linux operating system. And some people were pleased. They said, TiVo is helping us by using our software. I wasn't one of them. I said, if TiVo uses our software, that's good for them. And if they don't use our software, that's their loss. It's not as if they're doing us a favor is the way I see it. People are welcome to use our favor, uh, to use our software, but just using it is not contributing to our community. That's benefiting from our work. Anyway, the TiVo uses a lot of free software, but it also uses non-free software, and some of that non-free software spies on you. So it's not a good thing. And this shows that the goal must not be that people should, quote, use free software, unquote, meaning use some free software. The goal is not to use any non-free software. That's what you have to do in order to have freedom. You have to escape from non-free software. Malicious features go beyond spying. For instance, some of them are designed to annoy the user, such as by displaying advertisements at annoying moments and wasting the user's time. The developers first assumed that users just wouldn't know how to take out this malicious software. But then, when some users started figuring this out and advising others, they started putting it in the license. You're not allowed to turn off the ads if you're using this software. And then there's the functionality of refusing to function. And I'm not talking about errors here, this is intentional. Where the software says, I don't want to let you look at this file. I'm not going to let you copy some lines out of this file. I don't want to print this file for you because I don't like you. These malicious features are known as Digital Restrictions Management, DRM. The intentional feature of refusing to function for you <clears throat> because you're not good enough. Now, Digital Restrictions Management is, has been in the news a lot because Sony's Digital Restrictions Management also does all every other kind of imaginable malicious thing. 
and it's being criticized a lot for that. But we shouldn't forget just trying to stop people from accessing these published files is malicious in itself. All DRM is malicious. It doesn't have to be a rootkit to be malicious. But speaking of rootkits, that's another kind of malicious feature. Backdoors. <clears throat> One other non-free program that's that's been famous for a long time that you might have heard of that contains a backdoor is called Windows XP because when it asks for an upgrade Microsoft knows the user's identity and Microsoft can supply an upgrade designed specifically for that user which means it gets total control over what's going to happen to the user's computer it can use that control in any way whatsoever just as Sony can when its rootkit DRM is installed. <clears throat> now, that's one backdoor in Windows. Are there any others? It's hard to find out without being able to study the source code. In India, I was told that some Indian programmers working on the development of Windows XP had been arrested and accused of working simultaneously for Al-Qaeda, trying to introduce another backdoor that Microsoft wasn't supposed to know about. So, apparently that attempt failed, but were there any others that succeeded? We can't tell. Now, not all developers of proprietary software introduce malicious features. There are some who honestly try to develop the software to do what the users want. But they're all human, so they all make mistakes. And the users are just as helpless against the developer's mistakes as they are against the developer's malice. Either way, if you use a program that does not give you freedom number one, you're a prisoner of your software. We, the developers of free software, are human too. We also make mistakes. Our programs have bugs too. Every non-trivial program has bugs. It's beyond human capacity to prevent that. But the difference is when you use free software, you are not a prisoner of our code. You can change it because we respected your freedom to do so. Thus, freedom number one is essential. But freedom number one is not enough because that's just the freedom to personally study and change the source code. This is not enough because there are millions of people who use computers and don't know how to program. They can't personally exercise freedom number one. But even for programmers like me, freedom number one is not enough because there's just too much software. There's too much free software. No one person can study all this free software, master it, and personally make all the changes that she might want. So in order for us to fully take control of our software, we need to do it together. And for that we need freedom three, the freedom to publish or distribute modified versions. This freedom makes it possible for us to work together as a community to make the software do what we want. Suppose there's a free program and a million people would like it to do something different, would like a certain change. Well, by chance, there will be a few thousand of these people who know how to program. And sooner or later, some of them will make this change and publish their modified version. And then all those million people, including the non-programmers, they just have to switch to it. So they get the change they wanted without having to write it themselves, without even having to know how to write it themselves. And what this shows is that free software develops under the control of its users. 
If some users want to make a change, it gets made. Or if a bunch of, of users say, please somebody make this change, probably somebody will do it sooner or later. Thus the free program develops in the way that its users want. And if there are a few people who want some other change, they can do it too. But if most people don't like it, that change won't be included in the version that most people use. So even the people who don't know how to program participate in deciding which way that program will develop. This is democratic decisions about the software. But what about if only a thousand people would like a certain change and none of them knows how to program? This can happen, but they can still get the benefit of these four freedoms. Even though those users cannot personally exercise freedoms one and three, they can still get the benefit of those freedoms to get the change they want. Here's how. They have to make an announcement and get in communication and then they can start an organization. And the idea of this organization is that the users will join it but to join it, they have to pay dues. So, suppose every user has to pay a hundred dollars to join the organization. In the US, if these users really care about it, that price would work. In some other countries, maybe a smaller price would be used. Anyway, when a thousand people have each paid a hundred dollars, the organization has a hundred thousand dollars, which is enough in the U.S. to hire a couple of programmers for a year, so they can make a pretty big change, whatever change they want. In order to do this, the organization has to choose some programmers. So, they would go to one programming company and say, how much would you charge to do this job and when could you have it ready? And then they'll go to another programming company and say, what would you charge? When could you have it ready? And then they can choose. And this shows us that free software implies a free market for all kinds of support and services. In contrast, proprietary software usually means a monopoly for support and services. Only the software's developer has the source code, so only the developer can make any change. If a user wants a change, the user has to beg, please make this change for me. Some developers will say, pay us and we'll listen to your problem. If the user does that, the developer says, thank you for paying us. In six months there will be an upgrade Buy the upgrade and you'll see if we fixed your problem and we'll, you'll see what new problems we have in store for you. But with free software, anyone who has a copy can study the source code, master the software, and begin offering support. Which means it's a free market and thus any kind of business or organization that really wants good support can generally get better support for their money through the free market for support for free software. This shows us a paradoxical situation. Normally, when there is a choice between products to do a certain job, we say it's not a monopoly. But when it's a choice between two proprietary programs, this is actually a choice between two monopolies. Because if the poor user chooses this proprietary software, the support afterwards will be this monopoly. But if the user chooses this proprietary software, the support afterwards will be this monopoly. So it's a choice between monopolies. And this illustrates an important general principle. Freedom is something much bigger than having a choice between two fixed options. Freedom means having control of your own life. To have a choice between proprietary programs to do a certain job 
is to be able to choose your master. Freedom means not having a master. Freedom means using free software and escaping from non-free software. And thus, that's the goal of the free software movement, to escape from non-free software so we can live in freedom without any non-free software taking away our freedom. And that's the goal that I set out to achieve in 1983, to be able to use a computer in freedom with exclusively free software, without having any software that failed to respect our freedom. I decided in 1983 that I wanted to be able to do that, but that was impossible in 1983, because the computer won't do anything without an operating system. And in 1983, all the operating systems for modern computers of the day were proprietary. You had to sign a non-disclosure agreement just to get a copy of the executable version of the system, and the source code was completely unavailable to ordinary users. The result was, if you wanted to use a computer, the second step you had to take was to betray everyone else in the world, to promise not to share with them, and from then on, your freedom was gone. So what was I going to do to change this? I was just one man. A few people sympathized with me. It didn't look like I could build up a political movement that would convince governments to change their laws or convince companies to change their policies. I was not particularly good at political activity anyway. So what could I do? There was one thing I was good at, and that was developing software, specifically operating system software. That was my field. So I realized I could change this political situation by writing software. It occurred to me that if I developed another operating system, a large collection of programs, that would give people a way to use their computers in freedom. I just had to develop this system and make it free software. And this would provide an escape route for everybody who wanted to take it. And this made me realize that doing this, developing this operating system, would probably be the most important work I would ever have the chance to do in my life. And I concluded that I had been elected by circumstances to do this job. I was aware of the problem of non-free software. Most people didn't care. I had the skills to try to solve the problem and probably no one was going to do it if I did not. So I had to do it. It's as if you saw someone drowning and you know how to swim, and it's not bush, then you have a moral duty to save that person. Now, I don't know how to swim, but in this case, the job that had to be done was not swimming, it was writing lots of software, and that I was good at. So I decided that I would develop a free software operating system, or die trying presumably of old age. Because at the time, the free software movement that I was just launching had no enemies. There were lots of people who disagreed with us, but they were not actively trying to stop us from developing a free operating system. The obstacle, as far as we could see, was just to develop so, much, so many different programs to have a complete free operating system. And nobody knew if we could ever finish that job, and I didn't know either. I was simply going to do my best. This decision led to other decisions. What kind of system should it be? These were technical design decisions. Well, back in the 1980s, there were many different computer architectures, and every year there was a new one. So. 
I didn't know what kind of computers people would be using in five or ten years. So if I wanted to make sure this system would not be obsolete before it was finished, that meant that we had to make it a portable system. Well, I only knew of one successful portable operating system, and that was Unix. So I decided to follow the design of Unix. Furthermore, Unix had some good ideas by the standards of the time. So I figured this would give us a good system that, was, that had a good chance of successfully being portable. Further, I decided to make the system upward compatible with Unix because I realized there were lots of people using Unix and if our system were upward compatible they would find it easy to switch. I didn't want to just make a system that nobody would use. If people didn't use it, it wouldn't be giving them freedom. Mere success, mere popularity is not the goal, but it is an important part of reaching the goal. That goal being the liberation of cyberspace. <clears throat> These design decisions, as it happened, determined all the other initial design decisions. Because the structure of Unix is that it consists of many different programs that work together as a whole. In order to be compatible, we had to keep the same interfaces between these programs because the users used those same interfaces to talk to the individual programs. And that meant we had to replace each program compatibly one by one. So that meant that the remaining design decisions were inside of one particular program and they could be made by whoever wrote the replacement for that program. And thus, the only thing we needed in order to start work was a name. In the community of programmers who shared their work that I had belonged to in the 1970s, we programmed primarily for the joy of programming. Yes, many of us were getting paid and the rest were mostly students, but that was a side issue. The main motive was having fun. And part of the fun was choosing funny or even mischievous names for our programs. And we had a specific custom that when you chose, when you were developing a program that was similar to some existing program, you could give your program a name which was a recursive acronym saying this program is not the other one. It's an amusing way of giving some credit to the program that inspired your work. So for instance, in 1975 I developed the first Emacs text editor, an extensible programmable text editor, and there were many imitations some of them called this or that Emacs, but there was also fine for fine is not Emacs, and there was sign for sign is not Emacs, and there was Ina for Ina is not Emacs, and mince for mince is not complete Emacs, and version two of Ina was called Zwei, for Zwei was Ina initially. So that's a second level recursive acronym. I looked for a recursive acronym for something is not Unix, but none of them is a word, at least not in English, so it, it isn't funny if it doesn't have another meaning. So I thought, what am I going to do? Maybe I could get rid of one letter by making a contraction, then I could get a three letter recursive act acronym, something N-U. So I tried every possible first letter. Anu, Bnu, Knu, Dnu, Inu, Fnu, Gnu. But Gnu is one of the funniest words in the English language, used for lots of wordplay. And the reason is, according to the dictionary, the official pronunciation is Nu. So anytime people were saying Nu, they could substitute Gnu 
and it would be amusing. There was even a funny song based on the word GNU when I was a child. So with so much humor wrapped up in that name, I couldn't resist. Given a meaningful reason to name something GNU, I had to do it. But when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. Please pronounce it GNU. If you call it the new operating system, you'll get people very confused. You see, we've been working on it for 22 years now, so it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU, and it always will be GNU, no matter how many people mispronounce it as Linux. Well, how did people start mispronouncing GNU as Linux? During the 1980s, the work of the GNU project was to develop these many different components, that hundreds of components that we needed for a Unix-like operating system. And we did it. We did most of the job. By the early 90s, there was just one major component missing, and that was the kernel. We started developing our kernel in 1990. I chose a design to use an existing microkernel as the base and develop a set of server programs that would run in user space on top of that in order to complete the job of the kernel of Unix. I thought that since these were only half the job, the other half being the microkernel which was already done and or was being done and was running as a funded project. And, this, and since these run in user space, I thought it that would make it a lot easier to debug them. So I thought this was a way we could get the job done soon and have a running kernel sooner, which was the goal. It didn't work. It took many years for this kernel to run at all. And it still doesn't run well enough that we can recommend that people generally use it. Fortunately, we did not have to wait for this final component of the GNU system to be developed because in 1991, a college student in Finland developed his own kernel using the customary monolithic design where the whole kernel was one program all put together in one piece. And he got this to barely work in less than a year which is pretty impressive. Initially, this kernel, which was called Linux, was not free software. <clears throat> However, in 1992, he changed the license. He released this kernel under the GNU General Public License, which is one of the free software licenses. There are many free software licenses because any license that respects the four freedoms qualifies as a free software license. The GNU General Public License is the one that I had written for use on the programs we were developing for the GNU project. So, once his kernel, Linux, was free software, it was possible to take this kernel and put it into the incomplete GNU system which was missing a kernel. And the combination was a complete free system. And thus it was possible for the first time to operate a PC entirely with free software. And the goal that we had set out to reach in 1983 had been achieved almost a decade later. The development of the kernel, Linux, was an important contribution to our community because that's the step that carried us across the finish line after so many other steps that we had taken. But the mistake of calling the whole system Linux did considerable harm to the free software movement because that led people to think that the main job of developing a free operating system had been done by Linus Torvalds in 1991. Now, as it happens, 
Although Torvalds made an important contribution to the free software community, he never supported the free software movement. His goal was not liberating cyberspace. It was not completing a free operating system, as you can see by the fact that the first license he chose was not a free software license. So when people think that he basically did the job, then they look to him for ethical leadership, which he does not offer. He describes himself as apolitical. He says that he developed this piece of the system because he wanted to have fun. Well, there's nothing wrong with wanting to have fun. I was having fun when I wrote parts of the GNU system, and I'm sure almost every developer of free software is partly motivated by having fun. So this is not a bad motive, it's a good motive, but it's not enough if we want to protect our freedom. You see, freedom is never safe. Freedom is always threatened. And this is true in every area of life. It's been true in all ages of history. Freedom never continues automatically. If we want our freedom to last, we have to be prepared to defend it. And nothing, well, and, and recent history shows how true this is as the government of the United States has attacked freedom in the United States and has pressured other governments and encouraged other governments and even tricked other governments into taking away freedom in their countries too. Freedom is on the run all around the world and that's also possibly going to be true in the area of software. We can never take freedom for granted. If we want our freedom to, to continue, we have to be prepared to defend it actively. But in order for people to defend their freedom, they have to value their freedom, appreciate freedom, feel that freedom is important. And in order for people to feel that freedom is important, first they have to know what it is. In other areas of life, people at least know what freedom is. That doesn't mean it's easy to defend things like free elections, freedom of the press, free association, freedom of travel. These are big struggles today. But at least we don't have to teach people the mere idea of freedom of the press, the mere idea of free elections. They know what those are. But in the software field, these basic essential freedoms that every user should have are a new idea because the software field is new. It's only been 15 years or so since people even in the richest countries started using computers in large numbers. And we are still busy trying to teach people what it means to use a computer in freedom. And the problem when people call the GNU system Linux is that this leads people towards an area of, of publication, of, of writings, that don't talk about freedom. They don't help teach people about these freedoms and what they are. If people think that Linus Torvalds developed this GNU system plus Linux, then they look to what he says and he says that he thinks proprietary software is okay. He doesn't tell you that it's an ethical issue. Well, he has a right to his views and he has a right to state them too. But what is not right is when people look at the large work of the GNU project, which was done specifically for your freedom, and they think it was Linus Torvalds' work, and they think it was all motivated by his views. In the GNU project, we think that our work should be associated with our views, not with his views. And that's why it's so important to call the system GNU slash Linux. 
because that's the way that in a few seconds a day you can help in give people the information the preliminary information so that later on when they read when they see something that talks about what the GNU project did and why they will recognize what this has to do with them you see when people think I'm a Linux user and they see something that we in the GNU project have written they're likely to say this has nothing to do with me that's that's this is about the GNU system and I'm a Linux user so they don't pay attention how ironic if only they knew that the system they're using is basically GNU it's more GNU than anything else then they might realize I'm a GNU Linux user and then when they see what we've written about the reasons for developing the GNU system they'll think oh this has something to do with the system that I like so much I should pay attention now that they still don't have to agree with us but at least we have a better chance of convincing them if they know that these ideas are the reason for the system that they use you can't explain these ideas in one second that's not possible but in one second you can say GNU slash in front of Linux and that's enough if you do it a few times a day to prepare the way so that when people come across what we've written they'll pay more attention and our writings about these issues of freedom will have a bigger effect thanks to your preparation and that's why I ask you to please call the system GNU slash Linux we in the GNU project developed the biggest part of the system we deserve an equal share of the credit but if it were just a matter of credit and egos it would not be terribly important it's important because there's more than just credit at stake and I thank you in advance for your help but why is this important? Why does it matter? What are the threats to our freedom? In fact, there are many of them. <clears throat> I'll describe the most important ones. One threat to our freedom is that most distributors of the GNU slash Linux system also distribute some non-free software. In fact, until about a year ago, I couldn't tell people where they could get a free version of GNU slash Linux. People asked me, where should I go to get a copy? And there was nothing I could tell them. Now there are two places I can tell them. There is the Ututo distribution made in Argentina, and there is the BLAG distribution. BLAG stands for BLAG Linux and GNU. And both of them have the policy that they do not include non-free software, they do not distribute non-free software, they do not recommend non-free software. They treat it as an anti-social thing and they won't promote it. And that means I can recommend them as places for people to get a free operating system. I'd like to see more distributions that can go in this list and perhaps there will be more in the future. At least, though, there are some of them. <clears throat> now, what does it do when people get a copy of these places usually call the system Linux and it includes non-free software? What message does that give them? It tells them non-free software is okay. Anytime you even tell a person, tell a person oh, there's a program you can use, and that happens to be a non-free program, you're saying non-free software is okay, it's legitimate. And that is directly opposing what the free software movement is saying to people, that free software is unethical, it's an attack on your freedom. So this is an obstacle we have to overcome, we have to work against. Then another problem comes from hardware whose specifications are secret. 
it's hard to develop a free program to support certain hardware when the manufacturer won't tell you how to do that. So we faced a constant campaign of either convincing various manufacturers to tell us the specs or reverse engineering their hardware so that we can figure out the specs and that way we can develop the free software to use that hardware. And there is some hardware that doesn't work with free software today. We are looking for volunteers who will help add to our database that describes which hardware is supported and which hardware is not. It's a very useful job you can do if you are not a programmer but you're an expert on hardware. Then there are the legal threats to free software, laws that actually prohibit distributing free software that does certain jobs. In the U.S. there are two such laws and they're threatening to make more. One of these laws is called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. That law prohibits the distribution of software that bypasses DRM, Digital Restrictions Management. Thus, for instance, free software to play the movie on a DVD is forbidden in the US. It's censored. This is why I do not buy DVDs. Because I don't want to accept DRM media. Likewise, the corrupt discs that look like compact discs and they contain music but it has something designed to stop you from playing the music, stop on certain with free software and stop you from copying the music. That's wrong. They shouldn't stop you. And in addition, free software capable of playing that recording is forbidden in the US. Now, this is bad enough, but at least this prohibition only applies to a narrow range of free programs. Programs for accessing encrypted data. But there's another law that can prohibit any kind of free program, and that is patent law. You see, the US will allow almost any idea, no matter how stupid, and for any kind of activity to be patented. So, for instance, techniques for computing in a program can be and often are patented in the US. There are hundreds of thousands of software patents that have been issued in the US. And the result is, when you develop a large program that combines thousands of different ideas to do a complicated job, perhaps 10% of those ideas are patented, which could mean hundreds of different patents, each one enabling somebody to sue you for developing that program, and the users of the program can be sued too. That's a very dangerous situation for software developers and users. And not just for free software developers, it's dangerous for all software development and all software use. To allow software patents is completely insane. It's bad for software development of all kinds, including proprietary software, free software, and the majority of software development, which is custom software. Software patents are threats to all of them. So what you should do, no matter what country you're in, is organize to resist such laws if you don't have them and organize to get rid of those laws if you do have them. Of course, the United States is your enemy. When there is a problem in the United States, the US government does not try to solve the problem. Instead, it tries to impose the problem on the rest of the world. And that's exactly what it's doing here. The US is actively trying to impose similar laws in other countries 
through free trade agreements, which usually do a lot of other bad things as well. Any country is better off not having a free trade agreement with the U.S. And not just because it takes away the freedom of computer users and software developers in that country, but also for everyone else for in every other area of life. But that's a different topic. <clears throat> now, some people ask about free software and employment. I'd like to point out that if we look at the IT sector, programming is a small fraction of that. And then within programming, a small fraction of that is developing proprietary software, because most programming is developing custom software for a single user. So the worst that could happen in terms of employment if the world switches from proprietary software to free software is a small decrease, nothing to worry about. But it may not be a decrease, it could be an increase. Because free software leads to its own employment. Employment adapting and extending free software. There are already a lot of people who have this kind of work. I won't say that you can always find it. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but it's not the hardest thing either. You see, when someone wants to use non-free software, when, it, when a business or organization wants to use a non-free program, it has two options, take it or leave it. But when it wants to use a free program, there are many possibilities. It could use the program as is. It could make this small change, or 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 this medium change, or this giant change, or this, this, this. So many different changes they could make if they want to. But in order to make those changes, they have to pay programmers. So this means employment. Whether this will be bigger or smaller than today's employment in writing proprietary software, we don't know. So the change to free software could result in a small decrease in employment or it could result in no change or even an increase in employment. I'm not an economist and I won't try to predict which. But I do know that this is analogous to the situation with construction of buildings. You see, when a business starts using a building or part of a building, whether it's bought the building or rented it, typically they do rebuilding. They adjust the space to suit their needs. And thus, at least in some countries, the amount of work in changing existing buildings is bigger than the amount of work building new buildings. So there can be a lot of employment in adapting and extending free software for clients. <clears throat> now, I'd like to end by mentioning one other specific issue, the use of free software in education. Schools have a mission in society, and as part of this mission, they should use free software only. There are four reasons for this. The most superficial reason is to save money. Even in the richest countries, schools don't have enough money. They are limited in what they can do by money. So they should not be squandering any of their funds paying for permission to use non-free software. But that's a very superficial reason since it's only about money. And some proprietary software developers eliminate that reason by donating gratis copies of their non-free software to schools. And this leads us to the second reason, because why do they do that? Is it because they're such good citizens and they want to contribute to education? I don't think so. They understand that if they can get schools to teach people to be users of their software, that's like turning these people into drug addicts because it's teaching them to have a dependency on that particular product. And after they graduate, 
you can be sure that those same companies are not going to donate gratis copies to them once they're not students. And neither will they donate gratis copies to the businesses that people work for after they graduate. So donating the gratis copies for the schools is like donating the first dose of a drug. It's meant to get those students addicted and the school should refuse to participate in this kind of scheme because the school has a mission to build a society that is strong and good and ethical and helpful. A society based on the spirit of goodwill. Schools should not be directing their students into the path of permanent dependency on non-free software. They should be directing their students and directing society into the path of strength and independence. But there's a deeper reason, and that is for the sake of education. Education in programming. You see, at the age of 14 or so, some students want to learn everything about the computer system. If they use a program, they want to know how it works. But when the student asks the teacher, how does this program work? If it is a proprietary program, the teacher can only say, sorry, I don't know, you're not allowed to know because it's secret. And education cannot begin. But if the program is free software, the teacher can say, here's the source code, read it, and you'll learn everything. And if there's anything you don't understand, ask me, I'll look at it and explain it to you. And then you'll learn that that's the wrong way to write software. That's not the clear way. This is how people learn to be good programmers. Those few students are the natural born programmers, but even they have to learn how to write good code. You learn how to write good code by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. And it's only free software that gives you the opportunity to do that. But there's an even deeper reason, and that's for the sake of moral education. Because school should be teaching everyone the spirit of goodwill, the spirit of helping your neighbor, so schools should have a rule. Children, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with everyone else in the class. And if you're not going to share copies, you can't bring it to school. It's not allowed here. But the school has to practice its own rule in order to set a good example. The school must only bring free software to class so it can say to all the students, go ahead, take this software home so that you can use it too. Share it. Be a good member of your community. Thank you.